Hello, and welcome to The Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. All right, we are live on The Canadian Story with my co-host, David Parker, and Miss, I, I don't know, Miss or Mrs. I guess I should, I should ask that before I introduce you as one. Is it Miss or Mrs. Lindsay Wilson? <laughs> Miss. <laughs> Miss Lindsay Wilson. Awesome. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Um, could you just go ahead and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and what it is that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I am a former journalist, so um, I understand what it's like to be a part of legacy media. And uh, I, I am an Alberta girl. I live in Cochrane, Alberta, and I am the president and spokesperson of Alberta Proud. So Alberta Proud, it's um, there's been some really terrific people that have been, been involved with Alberta Proud. It's part of the Canada Strong and, Strong and Proud Network. And so we've got, um, you know, advocacy that's pro-energy, uh, pro-hardworking Albertans, um, everyday people. We stand up to uh, entitled celebrities and politicians who stand in the way of our prosperity, and we are big proponents for our energy sector. So we love pipelines, and we we wear it loud, we wear it Alberta proud, and we talk about these issues, and we have a very strong social media network. So even just saying the word Alberta proud, when I tell people, when I run into people I haven't seen in a while, and they ask what I'm doing now, I tell them, they're like, oh yeah, we see. I follow you on Instagram, I follow you on Facebook. So we have about 210,000 followers on Facebook that would make us one of the strongest um, conservative values and and uh, pro-energy uh, advocacy pages, certainly in the province, um, probably in Western Canada. And we we utilize that with pages that we have for most of the provinces um, across the country to um, run campaigns like standing up to what's a good, a good one I could tell you about recently was um, standing up to Trudeau's uh, proposal to put these Surgeon General style warning labels on our ground beef and pork. And so we push back against that. And as as well as, you know, the cattle industry and spokespeople in general. And so that's just one example of what we do. It's it's very strong. It's very powerful. And it's very grassroots. And I love that. That's what I'm okay, doing it's now. A, it's, a, it's one of the, the most unknown but powerful advocacy organizations in the country, I would say. And I'm, I'm biased because I also worked for uh, well, the Modern Miracle Network and and uh, and and helped with Alberta Proud a lot and and ran campaigns. And Michael Binion is obviously a former employer and boss of mine. But I just love what Alberta Proud is, what it represents, and how it has changed the narrative so well by just consistently pushing out the truth. Right? And ultimately, it's it's a it's a vehicle for for telling people the truth about our oil and gas industry and not the lies and propaganda that similar to the convoy and other things, a lot of people have experienced lies be poured on them from the media that aren't true. And they're beginning to wake up to that being the case. Could you speak a little bit, Lindsay, to how the lies about the oil and gas industry that are being dispelled by Alberta Proud? So I love what you said that we are a vehicle for truth. And I love that. And, you know, I think when, uh, when people like you and I, David, we go to maybe regional networking conferences and we see kind of other conservative or libertarian kind of freedom fighters, you know, there's just like, you, you just feel like we're, we're all in this together. And I say that not in the way that's been sent to us and fed to us through the COVID narrative over the last two and a half years, but I feel like we're, we're on the right track. And I think we're seeing some hope that we're going to see a change from this ultra left wokeism that has dominated our society. And, um, I, I, the world needs our best in the world, Canadian energy. Everybody needs our best in the world, Canadian energy, our Alberta energy. So right now we have this incredible opportunity to save our allies and to help get them off conflict oil by shipping them our best in the world, LNG. And of course we have a prime minister who would rather send them poutine and maple syrup. Oh, and some hydrogen sprinkled on top. So Sorry, I just, I just want to interject because I was one of these people for a long time. LNG is live natural gas for those who have no, no, liquid, liquid. Oh, liquid. liquid. Okay. So I guess I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> liquid you, natural gas. So 
Zach, I think sometimes we get in our echo chamber and you're right. You forget LNG, yeah. liquid, so LNG natural gas. liquid, natural gas. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I apologize for interrupting, but I want to do, I guess, clarify that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Zach. Well done. <laughs> so anyway, we have the chance to lead the world in supplying our, you know, our, our clean green product, you know, to, to our allies overseas. Um, and, you know, and we're just hoping the best for our German friends overseas and everybody else, of course. But um, I think the tables are starting to turn. I think we're starting to see there's this globalist agenda that has been attacking our oil sands and that that has has been putting this attention to what we call the unreliable alternatives, right? So I'm talking about electric vehicles. I'm talking about solar panels and wind farms. I'm not saying that there's not a place for that, but these technologies have not been developed enough. And a lot of it is, it's just, it's smoke and mirrors, right? So I think, you know, when we look at something like electric vehicles are, and, and I got to tell you, whenever I put an electric vehicle post up on Alberta Proud, it just like people go crazy. They love that stuff, right? Look at what's happening in California. Yeah. Oh, please yeah. don't charge right now. I was, I was, uh, <laughs> the it's going to implode. Like, right? there's, there's just, Lin- there's Lindsay's just... a general in the meme war. Like She's like <laughs> one of the generals of the meme war. <laughs> so you must have seen then, I just saw it like 30 minutes ago, the, the photo of the person in California charging their Tesla from a diesel-powered generator. That's my favorite. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> <laughs> so all we see is this constant hypocrisy from the woke left. I mean, how many components are used to make these electric vehicles? Were they made by child slave labor overseas? What happens to all these batteries, which are going to cost you fifteen to $30,000 to replace when they run their course? And where do they go to die? So I just think we... It, people are starting to get it. They're starting to see it just because, um, you know, the legacy media, that is the, that is the mass media and the legacy media, which I used to be a part of. And my heart was broken a long time ago when I lost faith. And I've, I've looked now and I know the futures in alternative media. I know that as strongly as I sit here today. So I, people are waking up. They, they, they know the gig is up. And I think as, as we see shifts on the federal stages, both sides of the border, I think, I think we're going to see some, I'm really hopeful. We're going to see some really, good turnaround in the next couple of years. I'm, I'm really hopeful for that. And I think, unfortunately, maybe it took this, this pandemic and, and all the awful things that happened through that for us to, to come full circle and to wake up and say, huh, there's something bigger at work here that's telling us that we're, we're bad in Canada and what we're doing in our oil and gas is dirty. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Right. I mean, I have, it's so I have, crazy to me. It's just so crazy to me that, that we bought into this idea that our energy is bad for the world compared to yeah. anywhere else. Like, and, and yet so many Canadians have, they've lost their minds on this. They've, they, they, they actually think that they're going to make a difference by buying oil from Saudi Arabia instead of Alberta. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is crazy. It's, um, and like I said, we have this opportunity now to get our help get our allies off this conflict oil by supplying them with our best in the world, Canadian energy, our Alberta energy. And we can only hope that we get the right politicians in place. And that's why we're so linked at Alberta Proud and the Canada Strong and Proud Network. We're so linked with what's happening in the political landscape because these are the people, you know, that that drive our future. So we stand up for and we support pro-energy, pro-resource candidates, um, which very clearly has not been uh, the Ottawa elite as we like to call them, or the just just insane, just transition, just in Trudeau cabinet. Uh, and, and we do feel the same way about the Rachel Notley NDP as well. They've gone on record too many times showing that they, they're just not in support of our resource sector and our, our energy. And so um, we like to take these opportunities whenever we can to remind people to get out there, get out there and vote. No party's perfect, but you've got to support the party that's going to make sure that we continue to be, we as in Alberta, continue to be the economic engine of this country, that we have limited red tape and that we have the freedom to do business, pay lower taxes and get Albertans back to work. And we we do believe that it's gone through a lot of shifts and twists and turns, but we do believe that, um, you know, the we it's a very key that we keep the UCP um front and center for for another four four years and eight months from now is not a not a long ways away uh, right not a long time you're gonna be you're gonna be a very busy woman over the next nine months uh i remember the last uh time we had an election Haley love was running alberta proud at the time okay. in the, the 2019 election and it was an incredibly busy time for all of us we 
we put in a lot of effort uh, to make sure that, like you said, Albertans were aware of the choice that they had to make, right? And I want to go into a few things you said there. The first thing I want to go into is you said that the alternative media is the future. You've worked in the legacy media. We've had a few uh, reporters and journalists. We've had Derek Feldebrandt on a few times. Andrew Lawton came on. You are a kind of alternative media at Alberta Proud. Yes, um, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> yeah, if you want, I want to hear about what it was like working in the legacy media, what it's like working in the alternative media, and why you think the alternative media is the future, because you made that statement. But like, let's dig into the argument. Sure, absolutely. So I am a journalist by trade. I went and got my undergraduate degree in English and communications and did a postgrad in journalism. And I, um, I've lived in Cochrane for a really long time. So I stayed and I worked in community newspapers. And I never went on to a daily timing of my life. I had three very young kids and I was my late mom's caregiver. So I stayed working in community newspapers. Um, and I did, I was with the Cochrane Eagle for, for many years. And I worked under one of the most well-known Alberta moguls um, in the newspaper business. And the, the late Jack Tennant, we lost him a few years ago, but uh, it's, it was really cool being able to be under the wing of, of one of the kind of OG journalists, right. Who started up so many community newspapers in the province and, you know, took us to winning awards, national and provincial awards. So to be a part of that news team and, you know, so a dozen years ago or so when I was doing that and, you know, we just strive to make deadline and fill those pages and last minute ad drops and the chaos of being in, in a newsroom every week and the excitement of when it would come off the press and be delivered at four in the morning the next day. And, you know, we'd go over it and, and see if our competitors beat us on certain stories or not. And then we transitioned to going online, of course, and having a Facebook page and doing all that stuff. So it was really interesting to see that. But unfortunately, the industry wasn't able to to make the generate the same kind of revenue off the ads in print media as they are in online. We all know that. So, so that has what's what's led to the to the media having to get buyouts from the government. And that's what's really changed the landscape of mainstream or legacy media. I'll call it legacy media moving forward. So I remember being back in journalism school. And I was raised by a by a refugee from from Eastern Europe. Okay. So my mother lived under communism she fled um she fled uh, uh, the the Czech Czech Republic then she's from Slovakia and and so I was raised with this mentality to be to be mistrustful of the government and and to watch for what we call creeping socialism and outright communism and then that's really been escalated now through the pandemic and we're seeing that we're letting governments tell us uh to to not ha let us have autonomy over our own bodies to tell us what to do with our children to to um whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated it's a personal decision but to have governments tell us that we have to do this and tell us that we have to do this to our children and and then we're seeing the legacy media it's like but they're just they just keep elevating fear and escalating fear and you know we all watched it happen and and it really i think like it was bad before it was bad when trudeau first got in in 2015 and all the pretty boy shots they're taking of him and you know instead of going after his policy and, and you're starting to see because newspapers weren't able to afford the salaries that once upon a time they were you're, you're starting to see real hack journalism's and you're seeing this real kind of leftism really infiltrate the media and it's, it just, it got worse and worse and worse. And then it's just gotten es escalated past the point of, I think, no return. So I think the media has been caught in a lot of lies over the last several years, again, heightened through the pandemic. And you've seen this, this rise in the freedom convoy really brought that to light. The freedom convoy, um, you know, bless that for happening. I think it's really exposed a lot of a lot of the what's happened. Legacy media, legacy media going on about how the people, you know, in, in downtown Ottawa can't sleep. And and meanwhile, there's real accounts like, no, I live right downtown Ottawa. They are actually pretty respectful, and there wasn't chaos overnight. It was a very peaceful event overall. It was incredible. It was, I don't know about you guys. This is one of the first times I've been super proud to be a Canadian in the last yeah, few years, oh yeah. right? Definitely. Yeah, and just seeing the trucks and the flags. And when you're in small town Alberta, maybe I'm seeing that a little bit more than, you know, certainly other places in the country. But it was pretty remarkable. And I'm pretty proud of our country and really proud of Alberta for their role in that, for sure. So you're seeing a lot of really great stuff. Podcasts like what you guys are doing, True North, Westphalian Times, Western Standard. And you're seeing this from former journalists, people like me, from politicos, from really engaged people who are saying, you know what, 
we promise you, we're going to put this out there. We're going to be on every social media platform. We're going to find a way to get our product to you, to get our news to you. And we're not going to take any government bailouts. And I think yeah. every alternative media needs to come up and say, don't worry, guys, we're not going to turn on you. We're yeah. not going to yeah. take a bailout. And and I think, I don't know if you're seeing this on Alberta Proud right now, although I'm sure you are, but we're definitely seeing it on the Canadian story is we're attracting a lot of people who've never paid any attention to any of these things. As a journalist and to a degree, as someone in the music industry and as a political operative or whatever, um, you you spend a lot of time thinking about politics, reading about politics, all this kind of stuff. And, but there's a whole group of people that have never paid any attention. Zach even counts himself among one of those people that is su- are suddenly paying attention. And we have a lot of listeners on our, our, our podcast who are very new to, to politics and to understanding it because through Take Back Alberta and other things. So I'm very interested in, in your perspective to share with them how advocacy works from the perspective of Alberta Proud advocating on behalf of our industries, because that's a hugely important aspect of a political ecosystem, advocacy, pushing for the values that you have to be enshrined in law, working with government, all this, that a lot of people have no idea about, but you're right at the center of. So could you explain from your perspective how advocacy works? Absolutely. So strength in numbers, right? Of course. And when we're talking about advocacy now, you know, the main way that we're doing in that is certainly through social media, but you can't be exclusive to any one platform. So I can sit here and tell you that Alberta Proud, yes, has a Facebook following of 210,000 people. On top of that, the pages within our network across the country, we're reaching millions of people with every single week. I, I mean, it's really quite powerful. But on top of on top of that, I do um, you know regular interviews with Western Standard with you guys. I'm happy to come on anytime. Speaking to networking within your own alternative media, we send email blasts out so you know people can visit us at um, albertaproud.org, sign up for our email list, and and what we send out when anything happens, um, particularly on the federal stage, anything with our energy. Um, with the energy crisis, anything with uh, the election stuff, like we send out stuff from from, from uh, our our email list as well. So we're kind of hitting it on all angles, right? We're trying to do the in person. You know, I'm me as the face of Alberta Proud, talking to people within the network. We do it through email lists, and we do it through social media and all the platforms. When I say all the platforms, I mean LinkedIn and and um, TikTok and Instagram, of course, Twitter and Facebook, and um, I think there's a few others I'm missing, of course, but uh, those are the main ones. So. Um, and what we do is we find like it's it's really incredible through Alberta Proud to be able to get your pulse on what the average person wants. Right. And you speak to them at a really common sense level. And you remember that the people who built this province and the people whose 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 backs that the government stand on, step on to get wherever they need to get going are, you know, the guys with the drywall on their boots. Right. The the moms with the four kids at home. Like it's the average Albertan. I don't care about elitists. That doesn't matter to me. That's not who are that's not who my target audience is that's not who i'm trying to speak to i'm trying to speak to the family of five who doesn't know if they're going to make their mortgage payment next month right who's paying 27 percent more in groceries this year than they were a year ago who's paying more in car insurance and etc who you know just the cost of living and how much that's gone up and that's the people that i'm really speaking to and so I think the thing with advocacy is you can send out these political messages, but you have to do it in a very simple way. People have changed anymore. They don't, they barely click on a link to an article, let alone read past the first paragraph. So we try and use a lot of humor. We create a lot of memes, Mm -hmm. right? We're a part of the meme culture and we share a lot, reshare a lot of memes and we create a lot of our own and share them within our network. And those go viral every week and funny messages, poking fun at these ridiculous politicians or celebrities who talk about how bad oil and gas is, you know, the Leonardo DiCaprio's out there. And, And we reach them with the messages and guys, this is ridiculous. What do you guys think that engagement asking them hey what do you think sound off below sound in the comments below we get a lot of comments on all of our posts i think people just want to feel heard and they haven't felt heard they weren't heard through the pandemic they weren't heard before that they're not heard by this liberal elitist government so i think it's a combination of all those factors if if that makes any sense but uh, definitely using humor to reach out to your audience and getting across on all platforms that is really key Mm. I have a question and <clears throat> I apologize. We're kind of, this will, this will kind of 
bounces back in the conversation a little bit, but you said something that's very interesting that I agree with. When you were talking about legacy media, you mentioned it was captured by the left or by leftism, right? Have you, th- and I, I would agree with that statement. It, it's not hard to look at it and, and see that that's true. Why, or have you thought at all as to why it was captured by the left and not the right? Like, why was that a movement of the left and not of the right? Sure, because conservatives are boring. (laughs) And they talk about fiscal policy too much. And historically, some conservatives have been, by maybe modern standards, a little bit behind on social issues. Um, I personally think that we talk way too much about social issues that... um, when it comes to modern day politics, like we focus on that, we fixate that because that's what people care about. They think about, they care about things like, you know, topics like abortion when it's, that's not even a provincial issue at all. It is like, that's never going to be walked back provincially. That's not even, it doesn't matter. Somebody should be allowed if somebody's pro pro choice or pro life, they should be allowed to have their own, their own thoughts and feelings on that. It has no influence on policy, but we, we tend to go there, right? We tend to go there. We, and we inundate about it. Um, LGBTQ issues are another thing. So, so I think, I think something happened and I was a big fan of prime minister Harper, Stephen Harper, but he didn't do so well with the media, right? He, he was mad at them. And so he would shut them out. He never ignore the media, always give them an answer. You can turn the dialogue, you can turn the shift, the conversation, but don't shut them out. Nothing pisses off a reporter more than to get ignored. And I think it started a bit of a war. And and then we've we've become this society where we fixate on hashtags and headlines. So so that's happened in the advent of social media over the last decade. And so people... You know, people didn't want to click on the articles when we're talking about, you know, inflation and fiscal policy and reserves and all that stuff. That's that's boring stuff to average people. They want the glitz, the glam. They have eight seconds to click on something, see what it's about. And so when you're getting them with the heart issues, right, the social issues, right, um, that's the stuff that brought people in. And so I think we kind of we kind of we dropped the ball. We lost we lost control over the message because we weren't we weren't talking to people about what they actually really cared about. Right. About parenting and education from a perspective about day to day. Right. About relationships, about sex, even about anything. And honestly, the left dominated that narrative. What people don't realize is that the woke left and their obsession with government regulation and their obsession with, you know, a lack of autonomy is that most of what they feel is progressive and their policies are actually very prohibitive to people living alternative lifestyles or, um, you know, that's probably not a good way to put it, but to, to people um, in their own social, um, their own lives, their own everyday lives. And that's, that's the irony of it, right? People that the perception that the ultra left is, is so socially progressive. They're actually not, they're very prohibitive and they want, they essentially believe that well, money grows on trees and, and taking away personal accountability and that the government should be responsible for you, which is, completely not what conservatives believe. And we've just never been able to tell that story properly. Mm. Why do you think that is? Why, why are we so bad at telling that story? Like, what is it about, I don't know, conservatives as people? I, here's my theory. I've always thought that conservatives tend to be more right brained in their approach to life, which means they're more about external facts and understanding reality than they care about their inner worlds. Generally speaking, conservative people are more that way. Right. They live with reality and are less concerned about feelings. It's just the nature of the beast. However, that the problem with that is that that only makes up 25 percent of people. Most people don't communicate via fact. They communicate via feeling. Most people are not concerned with whether or not something is true so much as whether or not it feels good. And conservatives are often. Perhaps too often. Uh, quick to say, well, this is reality when that isn't actually an argument that matters to most people. So I'm, I'm interested in why do you think that we have not been able to tell that story? I mean, this is called the Canadian story. We we're all about story on this podcast. So why are we so bad at telling this story? Because I think we failed to connect it to the person. We failed to connect to personal stories, right? If, if we're going to talk about fiscal policy and that's 
if we're going to talk about fiscal policy, you need to relate it to the family of five who can't pay their mortgage next next month. We don't need to get into and get into the weeds and what happened to legislature and fighting politicians and uh, point you know fourteen B on some drafted legislation. Nobody cares. Nobody's got time for it, and nobody wants to listen. They're too busy working two jobs to feed their kids at home. So I I think I think there's a bit of that, and I think we can switch this to you know. Look at who who is who's filling rooms right now, right? Who is rallying this country like no conservative ever has before? Now I'm neutral when it comes to the leadership race, but I will for a moment just let's talk about Pierre Polyev. What is he doing? Look at what he's doing. He's using the left's own approach and he's dominating. He's doing videos where he's walking toward a camera. He's talking aggressively. He's talking passionately. He's relating just inflation, right? Or Prime Minister led reasons for accelerated inflation in this country. He's relating it to the single mom at home who can't afford to put groceries in her fridge. So he's he's doing what conservatives have failed to do, I think, for many, many years. And I'm not saying there's not a lot of great things that the other CPC leadership candidates are, but let's just be honest, he is filling rooms. I've been in a couple of them myself, and it's really powerful. It's really incredible. Uh, he's talking about these messages like defund the CBC, and he's he's going aggressive. I think conservatives were always afraid, afraid of the maybe the repercussions or maybe offending anybody or, or going there. We didn't want to go there. And now we're like, we got to go there. There's no choice. We got to go there. And people love it. It's finally resonating. Because if the left can do it, why can't we beat them at their own game? Our message is better. Our values are better. Our approach is better. And it's going to cost everybody a heck of a lot less than it is right now. So I think that's a bit of what's happening. So true. I love that. Okay. I want to go further into this because I think it's important. You're watching this happen across Canada. You're right. Like some a movement. It's, It's not a political party anymore. Something like. So what is it? 700, I think it's seven, almost 700,000 people are members of the Conservative Party of Canada. The biggest in history. That's, that's 2% of the entire population. And if you take out anyone, everyone who can't vote, that's like 5% of the voting population is now a card carrying member of the Conservative Party of Canada. Why do you think nobody's been able to capture that in the way, is it, is it because the movement happened and Pierre got in front of it, or is Pierre creating a movement? I think it's a combination of things. And I, I think we can go back to the Freedom Convoy. I think the Freedom Convoy is a big part of it. I think the Freedom Convoy, um, I know people who participated in it. I know people who didn't like it. But even the people I knew who were, were initially very, oh, this is ridiculous. This is grandstanding. This is this is unnecessary. I've seen a lot of those people come around. It was a very powerful, very, like, you think of how many, how many, People took part in that, right? Now, the legacy media didn't cover it accurately, saying, oh, you know, a few dozen or hundreds of people. No, it's thousands and tens of thousands of people across the the country, right, took part in this freedom convoy and and took part in their own ways, whether it just be putting up a, a flag or, you know, Canadian flags or supporting freedom and freedom of choice and that sort of thing, or taking part in the convoy itself or showing up in Ottawa. It was, we managed to somehow, grassroots managed to somehow pull off the most successful, largest, peaceful, nationwide rally. And it, and you know, it just, I think, I think, I think that started it. That really started it. There's, after two years of being locked in our homes, that really got people going. And Pierre, I think, has just capitalized on that. And I think yeah, now, I, I think 100%. now. I agree with you. I, and I think it's kind of funny because I think a lot of a lot of people who are maybe a little bit more ignorant of these things and haven't studied them like you and I have just by observing them for our like as a reporter, you observe politics. You just have to. Right. You're just always observing. Right. And First as thing you do in the morning. Staffer, yeah. And as a political staffer, you're literally observing the people who are making politics. And not only are you observing them, you're often guiding them. And what you learn about all of that is that a lot of it is just storytelling. Right. Oh, totally. And, it's 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 everything of, is the message. Everything is yeah. the message. It's all in how you present it. And look it's at how the everything. convoy presented it. They they beat lies with just an abundance of truth. Absolutely. Right? And they hit it so hard. And there was just there's too many TikTok videos and YouTube this and that. People are like, oh, this no, this is really happening. And it's it's not what it's not certainly not what the CBC said. It's not what Global said. It's not what CTV said. 
the gig is up. The ruse is up. People are seeing it. Yeah, We've absolutely. come too far. One of the best things of the convoy, and there's a lot of people who had, who had seen legacy media um, shoot out their credibility previous to the convoy, but the convoy one was painfully obvious. And it changed the narrative for a lot of people because all of a sudden it was right in front of them, hey, I'm not getting truth from these guys anymore. And I think that changed the conversation in Canada in in, in a very, very exciting way. Um, and I think you're probably right. I think Pierre's probably, Pierre probably saw a wave and got in front of it. Um, but what I love about Pierre is the stark contrast to the previous leader of the Conservative Party that he is. <laughs> and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to talk you're dirty so about Aaron you're so mean. I, I hate them. Aaron. Well, I don't hate him. I don't hate, I don't think I hate anyone, but I hated what Aaron O'Toole represented because he was, I think, the weakest representation of a leader that I could have possibly imagined. And here you have Pierre come behind that with such strength and willingness to stand on idea and principle. And when what you have to compare that to is the wet noodle that Aaron O'Toole was, it just makes him look good. And you have to admit the dude looks good. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna argue slightly here with you, Zach, because I, I know Aaron O'Toole quite a lot better than you do, I, I would say. And <laughs> while I agree that he came across definitely as a wet noodle. 100%. As a man, I, I would say that anyone who puts their name on the ballot and goes as far as he did and does what he did and takes the levels of criticism that he did has to get a level of respect uh, for, for having done that. And Aaron's also a veteran in our armed forces. Um, I, I don't like what Aaron did. I, I think he lied. I think he said he wasn't going to do the carbon tax, signed a pledge that he would never implement a carbon tax, and then did it. And so I think for that alone, he deserved to lose. And I agree with you. But I just think we have to be careful sometimes. And, I, and I'm guilty of this too with Jason Kenney. I've obviously been quite ruthless with him for quite a number of months. But uh, I think it is important that we, that we respect that people. This, the, the, I think you could say Aaron O'Toole deserved to lose because he's not a man of principle. And I would agree with that. But it's not a wet noodle. You can't, you can't make it to where he made it as a wet noodle. Fair enough. Well, maybe we'll chalk it up to <clears throat> to how he represented his story. Yes, good. They're <laughs> perfect. I like that. Well, Lindsay, weigh in. What do you think? Hey, some of them just aren't aren't, aren't the greatest storytellers. So, I I will agree with you. I was a political staffer for two years as well. So, I was on uh, uh, former Calgary mayoral candidate Jeremy Farkas's. Um, I, wor I worked in his office in the Ward 11 office from Calgary, and uh, as well, I, I was on the campaign team. And uh, you, you will all know that obviously we lost last fall, even though favored to win. Um, there was the woke left kind of got that from us, right? Conservative vote splitting and that sort of thing. But after doing that and working as a political staffer, I uh, I have a hard time. I have a hard time being too harsh on on anybody who actually has has it in them and has the energy and is willing to take the personal sacrifices and sacrifice their family and put themselves out there on social media, which is just merciless, cruel, and often even dangerous. Um, and to take, to believe in whatever it is that inspires them to get into politics. Um, I, you get a lot of respect from me on that. It's, it's the, it's one of the toughest jobs out there and everybody thinks it's this free ride. And I think, you know, David, you've been a staffer and I think you'll agree with me. Like, it's not. It's 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 really tough. It takes a really was, brave was, big shoulders. It was way, working for Stephen Harper in, in the prime minister's office that made me realize I didn't want to be prime minister because I was like, that is the worst job I can imagine. Every day he would get stacks and stacks of memos every night. And then over the course of the week, we would get the memos back with his writing. Every night he went home and read memos. Like people think that being the prime minister is like, oh, you're powerful. It's just and I'll say this. I still don't think that that takes away from the things that Jason Kenney did to us and the things that Justin Trudeau has done to us. It doesn't, it doesn't, they, they have been, they will be punished for those crimes. Jason Kenney has, is in the process of being punished for what he did. But with that said, we got to give these people a little bit of grace. Like people are treating them like they, they could just take abuse. Like they're human. They're human. And I will say, and I don't want to delve into too much. Like, I mean, I try and stay neutral with all the candidates and elected officials, but, you know, um, 
Jason Kenney had a real tough job the last couple of years. And a lot of a lot of the decisions he had to come out with, you know, he had little choice but to kind of follow suit with Ottawa. I, I like to think anyways. And so I'm, I'm not saying there weren't mistakes made. And um, I'm a, I'm the biggest proponent for, you know, preservation of personal liberties and freedoms. Uh, I know there's a lot of flip-flopping, flip-flopping and the mandatory VAC stuff and all that stuff. I, I know it was... Um, it's it's not easy, but I can't imagine a worse time to come into power. And now look at us now. Here we are. We've let's just call it that we've come out of the pandemic. I'm sure they'll try and release a 19th wave this fall and tell us to get our 47th booster or something, but whatever. <laughs> but you know, really, we're coming out of this and look at how good our economy's done. I think he's done a lot to fight for Alberta and fight for us and you know. Uh, fight for our energy and our, our agriculture sectors. So we do want to just take that moment to acknowledge some of the really great work that he has done that we would never have seen under an NDP government. And we'd probably still be in a lockdown. So, and appreciate the movement and what he kind of, you know, and, and getting that going and, and, and uniting the, uniting the right. And, and all I hope now is, you know, there's, there's, we've got the seven candidates for the UCP leadership race. Ballots are in the mail. We're going to be getting them anytime now. There's there's a couple of big camps out there. There's a couple of front runners out there. You know, certainly Daniel Smith, Travis Tays, kind of two different camps there. Uh, they've all got some good and bad in them. Um, but whatever happens, I just want people to unite, to get out there, and to vote to defeat the anti-resource, anti-energy NDP in uh, yes. in eight months from now. And I really mean that. I really I mean that. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm going to go further. I'm going to I'm going to take this a step further. I'm going to say. If you care about your freedom at all, you cannot allow a woman who said that she would send people door to door to get them vaccinated to have power. Right? I don't care whether you like the UCP or not. I'm not a big fan of the UCP half the time. But I will tell you this. like It's just like Lindsay said. It's just like she said. We have to. We have to stop them because it's not it's this is not just about economics anymore. This is your personal liberty that is at stake. This is the, your sovereignty over your own body. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I just hope it, it's been messy. It's been, you know, pretty divided caucus. There's been a lot of infighting and really that just has the NDP chomping at the bit. So we just need to put all of this behind us after, you know, in a month from now, when we have a new leader of the UCP, whoever that may be, and good luck to all the candidates. I, uh, I just want us to put this all behind us and to move forward. Right. So yeah, and, and for some of these candidates to act through on their promises, too, there's some big promises being made. Right. So uh, let's just hope that, you know, they act through on their promises, because I don't think Albertans have a lot of tolerance left for uh, unfulfilled promises and for political grandstanding. So um, I just I hope the good people of Alberta should have, you know, that they vote in this UCP leadership candidate. They find the best candidate, the candidate who is going to unite the party and the candidate who's going to stand up to Ottawa, certainly, and stand up for Alberta autonomy. Alberta autonomy is a huge part of what we stand for at Alberta Proud and through the Canada Strong and Proud Network. Uh, it's a big thing of what we do. We believe we need our own police force, our own pensions, our own revenue agency. We need, and you know, I'm not talking about separatism. That's a totally different thing, but we need more Alberta autonomy. We need more Alberta, less Ottawa. And I hashtag that everywhere, all over the place. Sprinkle that stuff like glitter, right? More Alberta, <laughs> less Ottawa. I think all of Canada just needs less Ottawa, personally. But, oh, no uh, kidding. No kidding. Like it's just <laughs> I will say it's a beautiful city. I was there for the first time for uh, Canada <laughs> Strong and Free Networks conference yeah. in the spring. And, and uh, it, it was a really beautiful city to bike around and walk around in. I will say that. Yeah, I spent 10 years there. Uh, wow. After, and uh, it was, there's, uh, there's beauty there um, in its own way. I have a few last uh, questions that I wanted to ask. The first is um, you're a spokesperson, but you're also a person. Uh, what What do you love about being in Alberta? Like what, what outside of politics and resources sure. and work, like what is it about this place that you love? And, and then perhaps because we are the Canadian story, you could mention another province, maybe it's Saskatchewan, maybe it's BC, a thing you love about that. Sure. Well, little known fact about me is I was actually born in BC and then I, I went there and I moved, moved here after high school. So I moved here when I was 18. And so I've now officially been in Alberta more than half my life. So um, I am an Albertan. I've become an Albertan. So um, 
well, what do I love about Alberta? What don't I love about Alberta? I think we have this really strong Western spirit and entrepreneurial spirit. I think it's worth fighting for. And that's what I love about being part of Alberta Proud, certainly. Um, we have um, a beautiful landscape. We've got, you know, I love our rodeo culture. I grew up doing a lot of that. And so I've got three kids as well. And, um, you know, obviously they're kind of my heart and soul in the center of my life. And I like that I can live in a town like Cochrane where the, they're safe. Right. And um, I, I, I think we've got we've just we've just got a really a lot of really good entrepreneurial minded people here. And it's been the backbone of this province. And um, yeah, I think I, I, it's, I love that the most about Alberta, our spirit, our Western spirit. I think that's always resonated. Yeah, the, the entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit is it's a hard to describe to Ontarians. I spent so much of my life trying to explain Alberta to them. And they never seem to be able to figure it out. And ultimately, actually, Michael kind of hit the nail on the head in his last podcast with us. Uh, Michael Binion, for those who haven't listened to it, I highly recommend it. It's one of the best podcasts we've had. But he, he says it's about power, not money. And here in Alberta, we just want to make money and be left alone. That's really it. We, we love our lives. We have beautiful homes and, and our landscape. I drive around central Alberta and and I know everyone loves Calgary and Edmonton. There's all these arguments. I think they're all stupid arguments because central Alberta is the best part of the entire province. There's no question. Red Deer is the pinnacle of this province. And people can argue with me about it, but it's true. And you drive around here, the, the, the luscious land, the forest, the rolling hills. I mean, this is the Shire, right? This is, this is, uh, it's just beautiful. And I don't know. Yeah. People don't love so people don't love Alberta because of something ethereal. It's they love who they're allowed to be here. Absolutely. We have, we have, you know, less red tape and less regulation. We have, we have the, we have the freedom to, to be entrepreneurs here and to instill that in our kids. I also love that we have more of a choice in education as a, as a yeah. mom of three, that's really important to me. Um, I'm very opposed to one big bloated homogenized public education system. And this is not to down public education. I'm just saying we need alternatives like, you know, uh, charter schools and Montessori schools and Catholic schools and we're kind of one of the last bastions for all of that. And that's really important to me. And I, I'd like to think that we're going to continue in that vein as long as we have a conservative minded provincial government, certainly. So yeah, I'd like, I'd like to think that's a big part of it too. Yeah. Okay. So another part of Canada, maybe Ottawa, maybe, maybe tell us what you loved about Ottawa. I guess you said the bike lanes and stuff, but Maybe you met a bunch, like like when you were there at the, at the conference, you met a bunch of other Canadians. What was that like? What was that conference like? I love those conferences. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah, I love the conference because you're meeting people who who think like you, who are freedom fighters, who who just want, um, you know, hey, I want to go to work. I want to I, I want to pay. I only want the government to be involved in my life to to that, you know, as I want a limited role of government in my life. I don't need the government to spoon feed me and to give me handouts. I just, I just need them to get in the way and let me do what I do best, which is be an entrepreneur and run businesses and make money or go to work every day and not give my whole paycheck to the government and to never tell me how to raise my kids or what vaccine to put in my body or not and that sort of thing. So um, what did I love about Ottawa? Well, I mean, it is our nation's capital, so that is pretty incredible in itself. And seeing the parliament buildings, I got to go in them, but to see them, that was cool. When I was there, there was um, there was uh, all the tulips were in bloom, and I thought that was really neat. And you know, I was just sort of surrounded by a lot of people like 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 the three of us, right, with these common sense ideals and and wanting to help build a movement to you know bring Canada back, right, bring Alberta back, and. And so I love that. The three days I was there, it was great. And uh, no, I didn't love bike lanes. I'm not usually a fan of bike lanes, especially in our <laughs> northern climate where we have eight months of the year of winter and we don't really need bike lanes that obstruct um, cars from parking in front of businesses and hinder that. And I can't stand that they've done that throughout Calgary. But I did love taking a bike and going riding, going along the Rideau Canal. And I thought that was really cool. It was really beautiful. So there's beauty everywhere. You just got to look for it, right? Yeah. All right, Zach, we're almost done here. Any questions on your end? Yeah, so you're an advocate for Canadian energy, which I think is great. But I think something that might be fun, an exercise we might run um, before we close this out, it, I'll, I'll lob um, a typical argument or two against Canadian energy at you and see how you answer. Can we do that? Okay. <laughs> so, so like the first one that you hear, um, 
you know, natural gas and uh, petroleum are dirty and they're really bad for the environment. What is your argument against that? That is not the case because in Canada, we adhere to the most strongest uh, environmental standards and regulations and health and safety regulations and to extract it um, from the ground as um, carefully as we can. There's environmental studies and standards done on everything as far as how oil and gas extraction impacts the local flora and fauna and the water. Um, There's repopulation and, you know, reforestation programs that are prevalent and and largely sponsored by the industry and um we we don't have child labor stand you know that's that's doing this kind of work whereas they can't say that in Saudi Arabia and these other countries where they're pulling it out of the ground like we need oil and gas that's just we just need it we need more of it not less of it like all all signs point to that we're going to need more not less over the next 50 years or however long we forecast into the future and so why not get it from here where we actually have you know human rights legislation and health and safety stand standards and environmental standards and assessments in place to even get it out of the ground and get it into these pipelines. Pipelines are the safest way to to ship them as well. So to ship the product as well. So no, you know what, what's the alternative? The alternative, there is no better alternative at this time to feed the world on the scale that we need to feed it. Okay, fair enough. Um, Let me ask a follow-up question because this is something that irks me deeply. Ottawa must know that Saudi Arabian oil is dirtier oil than Canadian oil. Are you able to steel man their argument as to why they would choose overseas oil as opposed to oil that is in their own ground? Or is it just impossible to steel man? (laughs) It's difficult for me to wrap my head around too, Zach. But I think at the end of the day, we need to be honest and we need to recognize that Justin Trudeau and the Ottawa elites have a big globalist agenda, right? And so... You know, we don't need to get all into the World Economic Forum. We can. We don't need to, though, at this time in the interview. But there's there's bigger things at play here. There's there's people that are lining their po- pockets and making money off these unreliable alternatives and of uh, turn, you know turning the Canadian oil taps off. So there's there's more going on there than some of us are able to really comprehend at this point. But there is no really logical argument. There are incredible innovations going on within the oil and gas industry in Canada to reduce emissions, to, uh, you know, win the race to net zero. There's carbon tech, carbon technology and taking CO2 out of the air and turning it into everyday uh, stuff and things and even things like vodka, right? And so we're doing all of that here. We're doing our best practices. The industry is evolving, changing. I think we need to get better at telling our story and getting some of the woke left onto our side and saying, hey, guys, we're doing it. We're doing the best we can, and we're getting better at it all the time. And those guys overseas who are supplying the world with this conflict oil, you know, they're they're using children to do this work. They're, there's no health and safety standards. There's no human rights legislation in, in you know in place in some of these in some of these countries. Or they're invading other countries, or they're invading other countries. Right? Let's not even go down that road with the Ukraine war. <laughs> Agreed. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And obviously, thank you for the work that you're carrying on that I, for a very short time, carried myself. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to connecting with you in the future. And uh, I love your great work. And I look forward to sharing more of your content online. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's the CAD story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.